to the University of Life podcast and the second installment of our brand new course, How to Use Your Brain. And in this episode, we're going to discuss various ways you can use the critical thinking skill of complexity to not only develop better, more correct opinions, but also deal with problems better, solve them quicker, and in general, deal better with life's vicissitudes which is just a fancy word for all the crap that happens to us as time goes on so that it doesn't bring you down quite as much. We'll begin today with a scenario. We've got a problem, a story problem, and together, along with the critical thinking skill of complexity, we're gonna solve that problem. So let's, in this scenario, let's imagine that you're a decent human being and that shouldn't be too difficult because most people are in reality. You're not unkind, you're not unattractive, and frankly, you deserve a break. You deserve some, something good to happen to you. So one day when you happen to meet one of the most interesting, cool, enjoyable, fabulous human beings that you've ever encountered, you're thrilled to discover that they are as interested in you as you are in them. Uh, let's call this person Pat. So you get along well, you spend some time together. If you're single, maybe this could turn into a romantic relationship, otherwise it's a best friend material, the coolest co-worker, whatever. As you spend more time together, you notice that when Pat is around, you feel fantastic. You feel good about yourself because Pat is not only fun and makes you laugh and charming, but Pat knows how to treat you well, unlike, let's be honest, some of the other people in your life. And so you really appreciate it. And then one day, Pat's sister is in town where you're going to meet, and Pat gives you this little warning. He says, look, I love my sister, but frankly, she's kind of high maintenance, she stresses out easily sometimes. We've had some tension in the past, I'll admit, and she's really competitive. So whenever something good is happening in my life and things are really going my way, she often she always comes and tries to tear it down. Sometimes she'll say like the craziest things like, She'll tell you that I'm a narcissist or something. So if she comes up with some of the stuff like that, just be kind, you know, and just kind of listen to her and say, yeah, I'll take it into consideration because she freaks out when you don't. And uh, but but don't take it seriously. It's, you know, it's just something I have to deal with. I appreciate your your help with that. So you're like, OK, that sounds reasonable because Pat definitely. I mean, how could Pat be a narcissist? They're the coolest, nicest person in the world. Well, the next night you happen to have dinner with one of your friends. Let's say it's Bob or, yeah, that could be Barbara, or Robert, you know, whatever. And Bob happens to have been through an experience with a narcissist in the past. And now you mention this to Bob just kind of offhand uh, because it's it was just an interesting thing going on. And you're a little bit surprised, frankly, by Bob's reaction when they say, when they stop and they're like, all right, you need to get out as quick as you can. Run for your life. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Just get out. You've got to protect yourself here. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm not saying, you know, Pat isn't necessarily a narcissist. I just mentioned this in passing. But Bob has already hold, heard some information about Pat, and it all kind of rings true for them. You're like, and you're probably thinking, you know, Bob, you've got a little bit of PTSD. I can understand that, but it's making you paranoid. But because you're because you respect your friend, you love and respect your friend, you're willing to at least discuss it. And because you're committed to be a critical thinker, you're also willing to look at all the evidence and and look at details and take perspectives from different side from different sides and, and measure this out before you make your decisions. So you begin with the assumption, all right, let's say Pat really is a narcissist. Well, then what can you count on? You can probably count on Pat treating you extremely well for the beginning of this relationship. That could last weeks. It could last months. And are you really willing to throw away the best four months of your life just because you know this relationship is not going anywhere ultimately, either because you'll get tired of his narcissist shenanigans or maybe he'll murder you. Um, so, you know, that's something to consider. And you jokingly said that to Bob, who does not find that funny at all, because this is serious. And in reality, narcissists can become actual physical danger, dangerous threats. So um, 
again, you're going to consider the information. So you're like, all right, tell me about your experience with the narcissist. And they talk about how they behaved. And it started out really, frankly, a lot like Pat. And you're like, okay, I see the similarities. And then as it got worse, it sounds kind of dramatic. And you can see that your friend really was traumatized by this. It's something you shouldn't necessarily take lightly. But this is all um, circumstantial evidence. It's all anecdotal evidence. It's like one person's experience. And you know that anecdotal evidence is really helpful for illustrating facts and kind of giving the big picture of, of what it can be like, but not for proving things and certainly not for proving that Pat is or is not a narcissist. Turns out that Bob happens to have a lot of other evidence as well. And, pulls out their phone and looks up all these web pages that describe how it goes and, and, and everything. And eventually you become convinced that, yeah, you know what, Pat fits all of these things and there really is a strong chance that they are a textbook narcissist. And you begin to recognize those patterns that you didn't want to see, frankly, before. Um, but now it comes in your biases, your past, your history, your nature. You're a decent human being and you think, you know what, I care about Pat. And maybe I can help Pat to heal from this narcissist, narcissism and whatever events that got him into this state. Um, but out comes more evidence and things. And eventually you have to admit, you're forced to admit that if someone has no desire to change, then it's very unlikely that they ever will. So you finally, with all the complexity, all the pieces in place, all the perspectives and angles you can think of and the implications of all those, you make your decision, you call Pat up, you break up, you change your number, you get a restraining order, you go through all the things, you cut your hair and diet, you move to a different place. And eventually in hindsight, you say, you know, I'm really glad I got out before things got even worse. So enough about Pat, that, that's a good example of how you can use complexity. Now let's take it and let's use complexity in a few different ways and apply it to your life and if you'll take this homework seriously and actually practice it, then it's going to start to get ingrained in your neural pathways up there. And you'll begin to habitually think things with more complexity and you'll be smarter and wiser and, and you'll know questions to ask and things to investigate and it'll improve the quality of your life in many ways, as you will see. So here's your homework. Number one, I'll give you two assignments. Number one is I want you to use complexity to appreciate something more. You can take something like your car, your phone, indoor plumbing. I just want you to think about all the benefits of that, the time savings, the convenience, the um, all the work that, you know, the millennia of learning and science that finally led to the point where we could enjoy these things and take them for granted. And I want you to just not take it for granted. Every couple, every year, a couple times a year, I will think to appreciate indoor plumbing, my car, my LASIK surgery that I got like 20 years ago, best investment of my life. And it's nice. It makes you a more grateful person. And while you're being grateful for it, you're also increasing your complexity. You could use this about a friend as well. Like think about what are the traits that you enjoy so much in this person that make you admire, respect, or enjoy them. And are these things common or is this, is this a person who, if you just met in a crowd, you would instantly, you would want to be their friend uh, or is it, maybe it is more common and you appreciate this person just because you have history and you've spent time and effort uh, building up this relationship. So anyway, pick anything you want. Just look around the room and pick the first object you notice if you want, I don't care. And look at it from all the different angles and employ complexity and enjoy it more. Assignment number two. Oh, and by the way, you can just do this on your own if you want, but it's a lot more effective if you will schedule or have a conversation with other people about this. So call up your friend and say, hey, I want to practice this new critical thinking skill, complexity, or I want to think about indoor plumbing. They'll be like, what? Why? You can explain or send them a link to this video, better yet, and then have a call or make a schedule a Zoom call and invite a bunch of friends, whatever you like. Um, and, and, ha and get their input as well. And it'll make you even smarter. And that's the whole point of this course. Assignment number two is I want you to take something that you don't like, and more specifically, someone that you don't like, someone you don't agree with. And I want you to consider what it would be like to, 
to stand in that person's shoes and see the world from their perspective, from their biases. I want you to think about how they got there and, and what the values are that drive their perspective, what it is that makes them see that way. What would it take for you to actually land in their shoes and see their perspective? And in this exercise, what I expect you to find, and if you don't do this, you need to try harder. I expect you to notice that even in these things that maybe you really didn't like, there's also some good. And you need to see and appreciate the good and have a little bit more compassion for that person. Now at this point, some of you are gonna be feeling some resistance and you're, and you're thinking, I don't wanna feel about that good about that person. They are a monster, they deserve it because they want socialism or they don't want socialism or you know, they think you should wear a mask or they don't wear masks or whatever the case may be, right? And and you want, you enjoy feeling like righteously indignant you know, and it makes you feel like a superior person or whatever, or you just think they're horrible. Well, if you choose to continue in that vein and not be able to and practice seeing the good, even in the bad and seeing the complexity, because life is way more complex than just surface stuff, then I just want to point out that you are choosing to be stupid. And that's your choice if you want, but you're choosing to see the world inaccurately from just one shallow point of view rather than see the true complexity and you're avoiding becoming a better person by not employing these skills. So it's up to you, but I don't think you're the kind of person to choose to be who wants to be more stupid. So I expect you to do this assignment with sincerity and, and uh, on the other side, I think if you take a deep breath, I think you can realize that it really is a better way to be and it makes you calmer and happier and a better person and more cooperative and easier to get along with because a lot of those people probably feel the same way about you as you feel about them. And if you become a little more reasonable, you'll probably get along better and maybe our world can solve its problems better than we're currently doing because frankly, it's a little bit of a mess. I think you've noticed, but there's a huge potential. Like I said earlier, people are basically good and you need to see that in them even when you come from even when you wind up at uh, completely different uh, points of view and such. So, all right, we're going to end this episode with a quote. This is from Chuck Klosterman, who says, we are losing the ability to understand anything that's even vaguely complex. That comes from his book, Sex, Drugs, and Cocoa Puffs, A Low Culture Manifesto. Do you think that's true? Do you think Chuck is right? Well, don't let it be true of you. That's all I ask for. So thanks for tuning in again. Appreciate your watches, your shares, your comments. Uh, yeah, and after you uh, have these discussions, come back to youoflife.com slash think or to uh, facebook.com slash youoflife and find the post on this. Please share your experiences with practicing complex thinking and what you learned or how you benefited from it or, or something like that and help inspire other people. It'll be kind of like we're all in the classroom together having a discussion. And I thank you in advance for being respectful even when you disagree with people. So tune in next time. Until then, live smart, live happy, become your best self and enjoy living your best life. See you soon.